So I was answering some questions, and it uh, dawned on me that a vast majority of people who watch my channel have never probably worked at a company, probably have never actually designed a product that went into production or an actual device that was sold on the open market. Um, so I thought I would give you some type of insight onto what it takes to develop a new product. And uh, this is mostly based off of my, my experience. So, and I haven't done one of these programs for decades. So I'm just kind of trying to remember everything that was involved. And so this is my best recollection. You, you can insert your other things. Every, every company is different. Every company has maybe different nomenclature for the different things that go on. And this is not set in stone. This is just, these are the steps that, that typically you would have to go through in order to develop a product at a, at a company. So there's a, a, a product life cycle where you uh, come up with an idea, you, you, you develop it, you, you, you design it, you manufacture it, you start selling it, then you need to support it, and then there's some end of life. And so there's kind of a, a circle of life thing that kind of goes on. But this is the initial from conception to getting it out the door kind of thing, right? So new, new, new product development. So. Um, so the first thing is, well, what is the new, what is the new product? Um, and the ideas of a new product can come from different places. They, they can be uh, current customers that you have are expressing a need or a want. Um, gosh, if my oscilloscope only had three channels instead of two channels, or, you know, I could input, uh, you know, HDMI or, you know, all, all these customer ideas that come along from the sales team and the marketing team and R&D engineers that go visit customers and stuff. So there, there's, there's a, a, a thing that comes from the customer. You might have a new technology. Uh, you might be uh, in a company where they've just dev developed, uh, you know, LiDAR is a big thing in driverless cars and somebody comes up with maybe a competitive technology to LiDAR that uses some other way of doing it. And so you have this new technology, and you've got a bunch of patents on it, and you wanted to develop a product around it. So, you know, what would that product look like? What problem would it be solving? And things like that, right? Um, and then there's marketing wishes. A lot of times the marketing guys say, you know, we've been trying to sell this particular product, and it just goes, doesn't going anywhere. Um, you know, and that's because when they get around to buying the oscilloscope, they also have to buy a power supply. And then they go to the other company to buy the power supply. And then they, since they're there and their finance group and everything already has it approved to buy from that new vendor, they're just going to buy the oscilloscope from them. They're not going to buy it from us. So could you please make a power supply in our company and then we can sell both? So there's kind of maybe marketing wishes along, along the way too. So once you've ide identified what type of products you want to be building, um, then the, the 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 big guys in in the company need to make a decision, the business decision, and and uh, it's usually taught that there are three questions to be asked: uh, Is it real? Which means, is it a real opportunity? If you really did have a product like that, is it going to sell? Is it really filling a niche? Is it is it is it really something that people are going to buy? Right. So is it real? Is it a real opportunity? And then can we win? Uh, is our company poised to win? What do we bring to the party? What are we going to do better than the other guys? Um, if we'd come out with it, does, do we immediately get clobbered by the other company? You know, you know, can we win? And then does it make sense? Um, just because you have an idea for a product, like let's say the guy who said, if we only had a power supply, that would help our oscilloscope sales. Well, you could say, no, we don't have core competency inside our company to do power supplies. Switching power supplies is a very difficult engineering curriculum, and um, we don't have those engineers. If we, if we wanted to expand our company, that would be too much capital outlay, and then we would have to specialize in power supplies. It, it, it's just too far different than the thing that we're doing, right? Um, so it doesn't make sense. And if you can pass those three questions, then you say, okay, let's think about building a product. And maybe they hand it over to R&D. So R&D is going to take a look at it at, at, a, at a cursory look. They, they might do a, a rough system design on paper. 
um, try to figure out what would the different components would be, how it would all fit together, how it would work. And then they would take a look at that and they would identify the difficult parts. You know, is this, is this something that's easy for us to do? Is it something for us that's pushing our limits, but we can still do it? Is it something that we don't quite know how to do quite yet, right? You could identify the cost. It's like, okay, well, you know, we can build that thing, but we're going to have to buy a $25 op amp, you know, and a $25 op amp, that might push us out of the cost that the marketing guys wanted to have, right? So you try to identify some cost issues and you might identify some hard parts, you know, um, uh, which, which parts are we going to, are, are we going to need? And do we have assurance of supply? Do, do, are we able to buy the parts we need? continually are we going to get them at the at the delivery um, points that we need and things like that so you identify the hard parts that you that you might be and, and kind of going with that as component sourcing as w- w- which companies are you going to be buying all this stuff from right so some companies actually do component sourcing not only for the development of the product but the entire lifetime of the product I think Apple's one of those companies that if they come up with a new iPhone, they buy all of the parts necessary to initially build it, to do all of the production, and then to have spare parts for the next five years or something. I mean, they make some judgment of how many stuff they, and they buy it all at once. They don't have to go back and buy anything again. They just buy it all at, at, at one point in time. And then you start talking about documentation. You start generating some documentation and documentation will kind of go through the whole life cycle. Everybody needs to create documentation for products to get out the door. So um, there's going to be some meeting. Oops, there's going to be some meeting where um, a decision will be made whether to go ahead or not. At, at any point in these, there'll be a whole bunch of meetings where are these decision points. And at any one of those points, the company can just decide, no, nope, we cancel it. That project's done. You know, it's going to be too late to market. It's going to be too expensive. It's too hard. We don't have the staffing. Whatever it is, they're going to say, nope. We're going to kill the program, or we're going to put it on the back. We call it, put it on the back burner. We're going to we're going to keep it in mind. We'll look at it again six months from now. Maybe some finance will free up. Maybe some people will free up, and and we can do that project maybe six months from now. But right now we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna shelve it. Uh, if you do get the go ahead, then you need to come up with the money. You need to come up with the staffing, and you need to come up with what equipment you're going to need. So some type of 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 analysis is done. Do we need to add staff? Do we need to buy more equipment or different equipment? Uh, things like that. And obviously you need money. And then there's an investigation stage. Um, so let's say you're building a um, six and a half digit voltmeter, right? And you have identified that, well, the display is easy, the front panel is easy, the power supply is easy, all the digital electronics is easy. The hard part is the dual slope integrator that's going to get us to six and a half digits. We're going to have to really worry about that. And that's going to be a lot of time intensive. Maybe maybe there's a company who already has some parts that allow us to make that easy, that we don't have to recreate the wheel. And so you might spend some time prototyping the hard part, just just maybe the dual slope integrator, create some circuits, different different architectures, try different thing out, and um, maybe figure out how to cost reduce it or how to make it more manufacturable, things like that, right? Um, you might want to prototype the entire system uh, if you can do that. A lot of times people will hire a consultant at this point in time, um, and I I was a consultant for quite a few years, and so. Um, companies would want to do a particular thing, but one thing in the equation is something that didn't have any expertise in house. And they really only needed it, that expertise for a short period of time to get them going in the right direction. And they'll hire a consultant and the consultant will come in. Maybe, maybe you have a guy who's the expert on dual slope integrators and you bring him in he says, oh, this is the architecture you should use these days. And, you know, uh, analog devices has this great chipset that does this and this and this, right? And you go, oh, great. You know, now we're, now we're good to go. Now we don't need the consultant anymore, right? Or you might keep the consultant on. I, I've been consult, uh, hired where, you know, once a month I would come in for a couple of years and, and just kind of be in the background and keep them on track. Um, then there'll be a design review. So once you've designed the product, um, 
a good company <laughs> will have a rigorous design review. Now I've seen really good ones and I've seen really bad ones. The really bad ones consist of each designer getting up and showing what he did. The analog designer and the digital designer and the software designer that all get up and they'll show their designs and everybody will clap and say, oh, good job, Johnny. You did a very good job, right? <laughs> That's not the type of design review you want. The type of design review you, you will want is to bring anybody into the room that knows something and have them throw rocks at the design. You want to be brutal. You want to, you want to make sure that that design can withstand what it's going to take. Um, I remember doing a design once and they went around the company and they flew in from different states. <laughs> the experts in a particular thing, this is when I was doing optics, they brought in all of the optics people they had in the company to do, to do a design review on what I had done. And it was very rigorous. So that's the way you really need to do it. You need to step back and uh, let go of your baby. You, 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 it's, 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 you want the company to succeed. And if your circuit can be better, then... Take other people's inputs, you know, don't, don't take it in a bad way. It's like, oh, that's a good idea. I will incorporate your idea. That's great. Oh, I didn't consider that. I will go look at that. I will, I will do, I will do some equations to make sure that's not going to be a problem, right? Um, there'll be a manufacturing re review. Um, is this a thing that we can build? Uh, do we need uh, a different way of doing it? Do we need to set up a different product line? Do we need a different test procedure? Do we need different calibration? Um, there will be a big review about that. And then, of course, marketing. Um, you know, Who's this going to be sold to? What price? What volumes? Uh, what would be the product lineup? All that, all that stuff, right? All right. Um, so if you're an R&D, um, I think a lot of people on the channel are going to think uh, you design the part and you're done. <laughs> and uh, no, that's not quite right. Uh, there's a lot more to it. So... Um, you need to design for functionality, but you also need to design, you know, will it work uh, in certain conditions? Will it work over temperature? Will it work in certain environments? Will it, will it work two years from now? And that kind of thing. You also need to, a good engineer will be thinking about design for manufacturability. Um, is there a certain way to design it that will make it hard to manufacture? A certain way to design that will make it much easier to manufacture? Or a testing, maybe put some extra connectors on the board to make it easier to test or actually add some circuitry that's just there to do the self-tests. Um, you want to design for cost. Uh, you might find out that using two lower cost parts is, is better than using one expensive part. And so you design for cost. Um, your company may have corporate standards on how you design things or which parts you can use or which vendors you can use. And so there'll a lot of times be these massive documents of uh, corporate standards on how you design, how you design parts. Uh, at this point in stage, you might build an alpha unit. That's kind of the first one that you can kick around and you're always working on documentation, like I say. Okay, manufacturing will also be working on the project. They'll be looking for vendor selection. They'll figure out uh, what type of uh, production test fixtures they will need and manufacturing fixtures they will need. Um, they will look at text, test methods. Uh, they will be looking at maybe uh, places to outsource, uh, all those things. And they will be working on a lot of documentation, of course, as well. The marketing group. Again, documentation. They they need to have a product specification. A lot of times that that takes the uh, form of a target data sheet. A lot of times the R and D engineers are begging for a data sheet. Please tell us what the data sheet has to be, and that's what we can design to. And a lot of times it's a it's a back and forth and back and forth, a real struggle to get marketing and R and D to agree on what's going on. Because a lot of times neither one of them know. R and D doesn't quite know what it'll do, and marketing doesn't quite know what it needs to do. And so it's a living document. It will change over the course of the uh, development cycle. Uh, there'll be a target cost, target volume, number of parts re, uh, built, and uh, a lot of documentation, right? There'll be sales literature, marketing literature, application notes, uh, data sheets, websites, all that stuff. And then you might enter a phase where it's released to manufacturing. You say, okay, R&D kind of has a circuit, but let's see if we can manufacture it. So you'll build maybe beta units. Uh, you'll build some units that are earmarked for test, uh, some that are earmarked for reliability, reliability and other things like certification and compliance. You might need a UL stamp or FCC or a ROS. Um, 
if you have your own power supply, you might need to do a high pot test, an environmental test. I've built products that need to pass a, 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 a dust test or a, a, a water sealing test. I remember one product we did at Hewlett Packard where um, the guy who, who did the uh, water sealing test, he had a sailboat in the San Francisco Bay and he took a bunch of units and put them overboard on his sailboat and sailed around all afternoon and came back and pulled them out of the water. So they passed a salt water test. Um, shock and vibration. Uh, we would uh, put them on vibrating tables. Sometimes we would take them up to the second floor of the building and throw them off onto the concrete uh, parking lot. Uh, all sorts of things. Uh, we built one product and the big boss, you know, the CEO came over and said, oh, you, you did it pass all shock and vibration? We said, yes, sir. And he grabbed it by the cord, swung it around his head and smacked it into a concrete post that was in the building. Just swack. And it worked. And he goes, okay, we can ship it. Um, so, you know, you will have different, different things that you have to meet. Temperature testing. Uh, there'll be operating temperatures, storage temperatures, uh, you know, extreme low temperature, all kinds of stuff you need to worry about. Especially if you have something like a, an LCD display, it might completely die if you go into low temperature and stuff, right? Um, then you uh, finally are happy with all of that stuff. And you say, okay, time to build them up, time to sell them. So you have, have a release to volume build where you have a final data sheet, a final price, you have the sales channel advertising and manufacturing knows how to build it, manufacturing knows how to test it, and uh, it'll go out the door. So anyway, um, that's what I remember. <laughs> I've probably forgotten a bunch of stuff. Um, and uh, like I said, some companies do it well, some companies do it poorly. Uh, it's different at startups and it's different at big corporations. It's different if it's a military or aerospace project, might be a lot more steps involved. Um, so anyway, there you go. I hope it gave you some type of, some type of insight of uh, when you go to design something, it's not about knowing what parts to use and just doing a spice model and saying, yeah, we look, it looks good to me. No, 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 no. There's a whole bunch of stuff that, that you need to actually prove that this is going to work. <laughs>